Miller's house at Valley Mill in the Maryland countryside. For 200 years, as long as we have been a nation, people have dwelt in this house, farmed the fields, ground the grain, lived and died. How did they live? Even in America, where nature is generous, life is hard. The energy of back and aching muscle plows the land, splits the rails, does the work. For more than a century, working energy is human and animal labor, toiling from dawn till dark. beginning, when even windmills and water wheels were few and far between, people have had to manage for themselves. Life is good, but even to the very end, hands are never idle. still as God spoke to Adam, by the sweat of thy brow shalt thou eat bread. During the first century of settlement, towns and cities grow. After London, Philadelphia is the largest city in the British Empire, a center of trade and learning, Quaker restraint and Georgian elegance. Resentment against British rule breaks out in rebellion. America becomes independent. The war is long and bitterly fought. Still, in April 1775, the month of Lexington, readers of the Pennsylvania Magazine are learning of an ingenious new horsepowered dredge. Short of working hands, Americans are interested in any inventions that promise to save labor. Ships moved by wind power are the only form of communication the new states have with Europe, their main link with each other. With favoring winds, ships often take more than a month to cross the Atlantic. The fashionable event among intellectuals is the electrical party, where you can receive a real electric shock whilst touching or even kissing someone else. Philadelphia's own Dr. Franklin believes electricity to be in the lightning bolt itself. However, he sees little promise in the new steam engines people are talking about. A new homestead in the unsettled west country of Pennsylvania. A family is trying to clear the land and bring in a crop before winter comes. Time is short. Everybody works. The fire is only serving to rid the land of brush. And he wonders, what is this force? How could it be captured? How could it be used? There is work to be done. He leaves it for wiser heads to puzzle out why, in a world brimming with energy, mankind is sentenced to a lifetime at hard labor. The scientists of his day are beginning to grasp the great interplay of forces in nature, from the sun to the power sleeping in wood and coal. Inventors are busy. A native genius, Oliver Evans, designs a new mill, 
in which the great wooden wheel powers a completely automatic operation. Grain going in one end, flour coming out the other. Inventors of the 19th century are ingenious at finding new ways to use the energy of falling water. But their great achievement is using fire to make steam generating undreamed of mechanical energy. Early steam engines give way to higher pressure models. Strong steam, they call it. Fired by wood or coal, the engines quickly prove their power to run machines. When steam is made to turn wheels, the conquest of energy becomes the conquest of distance. The steam engine grows paddles. Coal-burning steamers offer service that is more dependable than safe. At first, they're slower than the fast new sailing clippers, but by 1840, steamships have crossed the Atlantic in 18 days. Labor-hungry farmers are cheering new machinery. The reaper, the binder, the cultivator, in a hundred variations. The spreading network of rails starts some 49ers west as far as the tracks go. But just over the western horizon is a greater treasure. Harvests of grain increased a thousandfold by the reaper and brought close to market by the railroad. By the 1870s, America is a new nation of big cities and growing industries. A country that has been torn apart, then reunited. In 1876, a special train takes passengers from New York to San Francisco in just 83 hours. And America has a birthday to celebrate. 100 years of independence. The Centennial Exhibition at Philadelphia is the biggest show this nation has ever seen. Out of 40 million Americans, 5 million will come to see it. And there is much to see. But if the festival has one theme, it is power. The conquest of energy made possible by iron, steam, and coal. The main attraction is a giant coreless engine. President Grant and the Emperor of Brazil join to set the big machine in motion. At last, inventors are making use of America's vast store of natural resources. Visitors remember the unfailing good humor of the crowds that centennial summer. Times are hard in 1876, but on this occasion, the humblest or the newest American can take pride in his country. Memorial Hall still stands where Grant opened the centennial a hundred years ago. Smiling Columbia still extends a welcome to all of North and South. At dusk, the great plaza still echoes to the bands, the voices, the excitement of a century past. Their buildings tell us of these people that they were confident. They built massively, boldly, and well. And some of them glimpsed a future in which man's new mastery of energy might lead to an era of plenty for all mankind. The centennial heralds the future in another way. On the 4th of July, 1876, 
as Americans celebrate, Independence Hall is illuminated by a new form of energy. Electric arcs light up the venerable spine. Many scientists are searching elsewhere in nature. John Erickson looks to solar energy. He has made fundamental studies, constructed what he calls solar engines. Sunlight falling on the rooftops of Philadelphia, he says, would power 5,000 steam engines. Other engineers are exploring different paths. Some are trying to find a way to generate power from new fuels that are available, such as petroleum and illuminating gas. The internal combustion engine is being tinkered and hammered into existence. The great-grandfather of all the automobile engines, airplane motors, and power mowers is getting a trial run. To his practiced ear, it sounds good, and it looks good. Engineers are still confronting basic questions with every practical advance. What happens when energy changes from one form to another? What laws govern the transformation of heat into power? What is energy? Questions the scientists of his day are working to answer. The electrical age is dawning. A new kind of light, the incandescent lamp, is one of the many inventions Thomas Edison would give to the world. From generators, electricity can be sent as if by magic through slender wires over long distances. Within a few years, in cities across the land, electricity transforms the dark night. For many Americans on the western frontier, life is as primitive as it was a century before. In new settlements, they stop for a moment to have their picture taken. Sometimes they show us more than they know. Life is hard in a new country. Others seem more hopeful. The nation is growing and changing. Many new immigrants come, hands ready to work, a million a year. The camera documents them and Americans of this time who pause to look at us from the midst of their lives. Times are changing. The age of animal power is soon to pass. Engines are moving themselves into the fields, the first tractors, some steam-powered, some moved by new internal combustion gasoline engines. With the growing demand for fuel, petroleum production expands. By 1903, offshore drilling has been started. Not that there is any shortage, America's supply of oil seems endless. And soon, every man's dream is to own a shining new automobile. The great American joyride has begun. With lightweight engines and powerful gasoline fuel, another long-cherished dream is beginning to come true. A new Edison invention is well underway by 1900. Far-sighted producers have discovered the formula for success, a sophisticated combination of sex and violence. 
motion pictures are also documenting an incredible era of industrial growth. The factory workforce totals many millions, men, women, and children. Coal has long since replaced wood as the prime energy source for industry. Making and using energy is big business. Giant generators are being built, electric motors of all sizes and descriptions for industry and home use, street lighting, subways, and trolley lines. The new century is picking up speed, and with it, the pace of life quickens. The energy revolution has launched the country on a voyage, destination unknown, and people are rushing to get on. For many, the new jobs mean liberation from the drudgery and loneliness of farm life. For many others, it means only repetitious routine work. For better or for worse, the machine has arrived, and Americans struggle to master it. Some succeed, and for some, well, the internal combustion engine will always remain a mystery. Fourth of July in a small western town. Time, the early 20s. This year, as every year, the firemen compete to prove that human speed and agility have no equal. But hose pressure comes direct from a hard-working pumping engine. Americans are learning to live with the machine, trying to gain the benefits of progress in health, in comfort, in a better life, while absorbing the shock of many changes. The cameras of small town photographers mirror these decades, the 20s, the 30s, and 40s, in the faces of ordinary people, while change continues to sweep across their lives. Today, the world they have built surrounds us based on 200 years of invention, science, and human labor. Energy powers a nation geared to using it freely to live and move, make and produce. The hopes of the past for overflowing abundance seem realized, and yet, the very control over nature our forefathers worked so hard to achieve has led to a crisis in our time different than any they encountered. The fuels they thought inexhaustible are being used up rapidly. America is running out of gas. And it is our turn to seek new ways to generate power. Each time we have shifted to new sources of power, history tells us, it's taken 60 years. America cannot afford to wait. To promote a national effort, a federal agency has been created to plan the best use of our present resources to mobilize science, industry, and government to develop new sources of energy, and to accomplish this without injuring the environment. It's an American tradition, confidence in man's powers of invention. Every promising source is being explored, from machines that draw power out of the free-flowing tides of air and sunlight, to fusion, our massive effort in the complex field of nuclear reactions with the promise of power 
that is truly limitless. Science has already harnessed the first new source of power discovered in a century. Nuclear reactors have been generating electricity for more than 25 years. By 1990, they will meet a large part of our needs for power. In the nation's oil fields, old wells are being treated to make them give up more oil. Enhanced recovery, it's called, and we are going far to bring in new supplies. Producing more energy would be meaningless without conservation. A major study focuses on America's favorite means of transportation, searching for engines that will go much farther on much less fuel. Battery-powered cars are being tested and a variety of other power plants to save energy. The interest future drivers show is more than curious. It's a look into the next 20 years. Still another long-range effort studies how to extract oil trapped in layers of rock, oil shale. What prospectors of the past thought worthless is crushed and processed in a pilot plant, a small-scale trial of full production that a 19th century capitalist would have envied. What comes out is oil, along with the data on recovery that will guide further development. Much work is concentrating on the fuel that is still America's primary resource, our vast reserves of coal. Coal, we are learning, is more than coal, a complex hydrocarbon whose chemistry is not easily understood. Using this knowledge in new plants, our present ability to transform coal into synthetic gas or oil will be greatly expanded. A research project in combustion mixes high sulfur coal with limestone to make it burn cleaner and more efficiently. In a pilot plant, the mixture is consumed under highly controlled conditions with a tension that a humble scuttle of coal never enjoyed before. Floating on a stream of air, the particles burn to power a million watt gas turbine. It seems a setting for the 19th century fantasy of a voyage to the center of the earth. In a western desert, they're piping high pressure steam and brine from far below the surface to learn how it might be harnessed to a turbine generator. Some geothermal forces are already being used to meet one-third of San Francisco's power needs. At other sites, we are exploring use of geothermal reservoirs that have useful temperatures as low as 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Some studies have a significance far beyond their size. In this miniature experiment, the scientist is burning coal inside a glass column to determine if coal might be burned while still in the earth to generate methane gas. In his curiosity, he is part of a tradition of everyone who ever gazed in wonder at fire. And he too is asking questions. How best to turn this fuel into useful energy how can we produce energy without waste? The dreams of Ericsson and other visionaries move a step closer to achievement with renewed studies of sun power. The ultimate goal, to turn the sun's energy directly into electricity. Ericsson's proposal to cover rooftops with solar collectors has been put into practice. Collectors soak up sun to provide buildings below with heat or cooling, and 
they send data to a battery of recorders to help chart the way in the use of solar energy. In a time of shortages, we are still surrounded by a world that is overflowing with energy. The forces still hidden deep in the nucleus of the atom or in the flame or the seas can become ours, just as others before us harnessed elemental powers of heat and electricity. We who share in their achievements cannot give any less imagination or skill to the problems we face in our own time. To find sources of energy that are truly inexhaustible in the sun or in the world around us. The people who crowd to see the place where long ago 13 united colonies declared themselves free and independent are not so different from the people who waited one July day for the State House bell to ring. people in the procession that moves out of the past into the future. The people who built the house at Valley Mill, who farmed its land and ground its grain. The same people whose capable hands forged the foundations of modern life. The people working today with all of those from one generation to the next who seek to lift out of bondage man's body and his spirit. 